People have always been enchanted with the idea of leaving the bondage of the Earth's gravity and journeying to some place beyond. According to the Old Testament, a chariot of fire carried the prophet Elijah up into heaven. In 1694, astronomer Johannes Kepler considered a journey to the moon in his work Somnium. And Edgar Rice Burroughs wrote many fantasies that took place on Mars. The human heart longs for expanded horizons, to see new things, and to discover that in this frighteningly vast universe, we are not alone. For most of history, such dreams were the stuff of myth and fantasy. People had no idea of the kind of medium they would have to go through to reach the planets or stars. They didn't know how far they would have to travel, and they were not sure what they would find if somehow they did get there. Even after people learned to make machines which could fly, travel into space was prevented by the speeds necessary to leave the surface of the Earth. Escape velocity, as it is called, is about 25,000 miles an hour. But breakthroughs did come as new rockets were built. It is an ironic note in history that the technology necessary for human beings to realize the dream of spaceflight was developed in the nightmare of war. At the beginning of World War II, Adolf Hitler commanded the scientific community in Germany to develop rockets capable of delivering devastating blows to his enemies. The result was the infamous V-2 rocket, used by Hitler to rain destruction upon London. But for all its wicked past, the V-2 is considered the grandfather of today's modern launch vehicles. By the end of World War II, developing missile technology made the idea of reaching into space a realistic one. Scientists saw how the rockets of war might be redesigned to deliver payloads, and perhaps even men, into orbit. The Soviet Union got there first. In 1957, they launched the first artificial satellite called Sputnik into orbit around the Earth. Russia's successful launch threw down the gauntlet to the United States of America. In 1961, President John Kennedy responded with a challenge of his own to put a man on the moon before the decade was out. Now it is time to take longer strides time for a great new American enterprise, time for this nation to take a clearly leading role in space achievement, which in many ways may hold the key to our future on Earth. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. No single space project in this period it will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space. Kennedy's call to action put space exploration among the top priorities in both countries. As a result, we sent probes such as Ranger, Surveyor, and Lunar Orbiter to our first goal, the Moon. But we also sent other probes to places people might like to visit in the more distant future. These devices have names which are now famous. Mariner, Pioneer, Viking, Venera, and of course Voyager. Combined, these probes have visited and collected data on every planet in the solar system, with the exception of distant Pluto. During this time of intense exploration, many people felt our species was finally coming of age, leaving the planet and would soon be off to the stars. It was a premature hope, for these people didn't fully appreciate how difficult interstellar travel is. To understand the enormity of the task, we might compare a trip to Mars with one to Alpha Centauri. Mars is about 50 million miles away at its closest approach to Earth. What would it take to send an expedition to Mars? Well, first it takes timing. Earth and Mars align for an optimal launch only once every two years. This direct insertion, as it's called, is the most economical and least risky for the astronauts. Using the best rocket technology we already have, the trip to the Red Planet would take about six months. Once there, the astronauts would have to return immediately or wait two years for the next alignment of the planets. The logistics of such a trip are mind-boggling. 
Stockpiles of supplies would have to be sent ahead of the manned expedition and placed on the planet for the crew's arrival. Still, the mission is within our grasp. As they say, we have the technology. Scientists have developed several scenarios for a manned mission to Mars, and humans may well set foot on the planet in your lifetime. To get back to our comparison, the Alpha Centauri system is a whopping 25 trillion miles distant. In other words, about 500,000 times further than a trip to Mars. To give a sense of the distance, we can look at the speediest craft we have made to date, Helios. Launched by Germany at uh, 32 miles per second, it holds the record. If it had a track that would hold it to the ground, it would zip around the Earth in 12 and a half minutes. At such a huge speed, you'd think that it would reach the nearest star in short time, but it would actually take a spacecraft traveling that fast more than 24,000 years to reach the Centauri system. This is an immense distance, and remember, Alpha Centauri is our nearest stellar neighbor, the adjoining cosmic property, you might say. If we cannot reach it, we certainly cannot reach other stars. It obviously makes Mars seem close. So how can we think about a trip that is a half million times greater in distance, one that would take centuries at the speed of our fastest spacecraft? Well, there are people who dream about such trips and try to turn them into reality. These visionaries have devised a number of different methods which have technological possibilities. We'll return to the practical guide to the universe on the Learning Channel. Before nightfall, 40,000 children will die from hunger and disease. Monday at 8.30 on the Learning Channel. We now return to the practical guide to the universe on the Learning Channel. The first problem these visionaries have to tackle is that of acceleration. To reach the nearest stars in a reasonable time frame, we need to achieve not just speed, but continually increasing speeds, otherwise known as acceleration. Some people argue that the ideal acceleration would be 1g, 32 feet per second squared. When accelerating at 1g, the crew would have the sensation of weight, just as on the surface of the Earth. Conveniently enough, 1g represents enough acceleration to get us to the nearest stars in a reasonable amount of time. An acceleration of 1g will allow us to reach the near stars, but is it realistic? Can we create a drive that powerful? If we look at the technology that is available now, we see that the best chemical rockets are woefully inadequate for the job. Some have envisioned using a kind of power already available here on Earth, nuclear fission reactors like the ones used to power nuclear submarines and light our cities. A fission-driven craft might eventually reach a nearby star, but several generations of crew would have lived and died on board before arriving. You see, with such a drive, a trip to the Centauri system would take about 400 years. It would need a reactor large enough to power a city, and even with all that power, it would still only attain a little over 1% of the speed of light. Others have proposed a spacecraft driven by nuclear fusion rather than fission, in effect harnessing the power of the hydrogen bomb. In fact, scientists have already designed such an explosive drive system, on the drawing board at least. They called it Orion. In theory, we already have the know-how to design this bomb-driven spacecraft. Other more exotic fuels remain beyond our technology, yet continue to tantalize the star travel visionaries. Antimatter is one example. Physicists have discovered there is a whole class of matter that is the mirror image of normal matter that we are familiar with. This matter has the same weight as ordinary matter, but 
the opposite spin and electrical charge. When matter and antimatter come together, they destroy each other and release a burst of pure energy. We've already been able to manufacture antimatter in particle accelerators, but only at a huge cost in energy, and the amounts are better measured in atoms than in ounces. Still, if we can make it in quantity, antimatter can achieve the 1G acceleration. For the nearest stars, another way to deal with the fuel problem is simply not to take any fuel in the spacecraft. <laughs> Pretty good idea, huh? You may be wondering how a spacecraft could get anywhere if it didn't carry any fuel. Well, what is needed is a way to burn fuel and have its energy applied to the spacecraft over distance. One kind of ship NASA has considered for traveling around to the various planets and to reach Halley's Comet is a sailing ship. But this sailing ship is powered by sunlight. A spaceship with a light sail could accelerate continuously on a journey to the outer planets. Light particles rushing out from the sun propel the sail and the craft to its destination. Also, like a sailing ship on the sea, the sail can use the power of light to sail back towards the sun. But ordinary sunlight has its limits. There's not enough sunlight to push it into interstellar space, so if we want to use solar power to get us to the stars, we'll need to amplify the sunlight considerably, perhaps with a huge sun-powered laser. When you look at interstellar distances and you think about having to accelerate all the fuel that it takes to, to travel at the speed you want to to get to the star, the, the idea comes up of what if we left the power plant at home and projected the energy, transmitted the energy to the spacecraft by a beam a microwave beam or a laser, a photon beam. And so the, the laser cell or the solar cell, the solar cell uses a sun solar system. The laser cell uses a, a high power laser left in the solar system, probably near the sun and an orbit around Mercury. And it projects a beam out that, the, that pushes on the cell that accelerates it to very high velocities to let you let you would need for stellar travel or travel to Alpha Centauri anyway. The craft's sail would be enormous, over 650 miles across. Huge size would be necessary not only to send the ship on its way at half the speed of light, but also to slow it down when it reached the target star. A trip of this kind would take great faith on the part of the crew. They would have to trust people back in our solar system to start and stop the laser at the appropriate times. The round trip time using the propulsion system would roughly be 50 years for nearer stars. We'll return to the practical guide to the universe on the Learning Channel. The blackened coil and wine. A big difference. We now return to the practical guide to the universe on the Learning Channel. Light sails and lasers take us well into the next century, but the visionaries have propulsion systems in mind for the centuries beyond. One such futuristic mode of transport is the hydrogen ramjet. For fuel, this craft would collect the sparse hydrogen atoms in deep space with the help of an enormous funnel. The ramjet technology is still far in our future, but it would tap into an unlimited supply of free fuel and therefore unlimited periods of acceleration. This hydrogen ramjet could reach velocities close to light speed. Half could experience the strange effects predicted in Einstein's theory of relativity. The theory of relativity states, in simplified terms, that time slows down as you approach the speed of light. Not just clocks, but all life functions slow down as well. Therefore, an astronaut moving very quickly through space ages more slowly than we do on Earth. Were we able to look inside a spaceship, traveling it near the speed of light, it would look to us as though the people were frozen and their onboard clocks were stopped. Now this is 
a strange concept and difficult to fully understand, to say the least, but it is a fundamental truth. It's already been tested with matching atomic clocks placed aboard spacecraft in orbit and mounted in laboratories on Earth. And in every case, the clocks brought back from space showed less time had passed than the clocks in the laboratory. So what this means in a practical sense is that the closer you're moving to the speed of light, the slower time will pass for you relative to lows on Earth. So in essence, you're going to live a lot longer than your pals if you're traveling in space. For example, if you traveled to another star and back at nearly the speed of light, you might feel as only, say, 12 years or so had passed. Physically and mentally, you would be only about 12 years older. But your friends on Earth would have grown old and died before you returned. This could pose some psychological problems for the crew. The bottom line is, how do you understand the psychology of, of doing something and having the environment you're used to change at a rate different than that which you're changing? I mean, if, if I aged one year traveling around the solar system at 0.9 C, 0.9 the speed of light, even around near galaxy, and came back in a year, and everyone else had aged four years or 40, I mean, how would I accommodate that? On this spaceship, the crew would be almost immortal to our eyes on Earth. You see, once the ship has accelerated close to the speed of light within our galaxy, it could coast to a neighbor galaxy. The people on board wouldn't age much in relationship to us back on Earth, as long as the ship kept moving at that speed. For all practical purposes, the trip would be one way, in the sense that it would not have any direct benefit for the generation of people who remained on the Earth. If the ship visited the closest spiral galaxy to ours, Andromeda, and then returned, the crew might be only 10 years older, but on Earth, over four and a half million years would have passed. Pretty scary, huh? For the crew, it would be as if they had traveled millions of years forward in time. This is time travel in the truest sense, but at what cost? One wonders what they would find upon return. Would the human race still exist? It's possible. Our solar system might be thriving with lush green worlds created from the sterile planetary bodies we found in our first explorations. Perhaps we would have huge colonies free floating in space. There might be some sort of commerce with nearby stellar systems and possibly contact with intelligent aliens. On the other hand, the returning travelers might find the planets unharvested the Earth itself devoid of any but the most primitive life forms, struggling back from a colossal extinction. It has happened before, and we could bring it on ourselves. A good reason to become established on other planetary bodies is to assure the preservation of human life and Earth's supporting ecology should disaster strike our planet. In the same vein, Travel to other stars would assure continued life if a disaster was to strike the entire solar system. But it's a small investment for a payoff that could actually provide some kind of lifeboat for the Earth in the event of catastrophes beyond our imagination. And being able to consider living off this world. And, and I don't think that's unrealistic. It's just hard to imagine because perhaps like me, a lot of people have read science fiction, and you, know, you read about this and think, yeah, right, great, science fiction. But it shouldn't be. I mean, NASA has talked about missions you know, that you could start now to the nearest star using controlled nuclear uh, propulsion systems. And basically, you launch it now, and you let two generations from now analyze the data. And you know, are those missions really as crazy as they sound? They're investments in a future that a lot of people nowadays aren't willing to make. I mean, think of the construction of the great cathedrals of Europe. Very often they took 150 years. But why worry about space travel now with the multitude of problems here on Earth? Sound familiar? Well, 30 years ago, President John Kennedy answered that question with words that are still true today. So it is not surprising that some would have us stay where we are a little longer, to rest, to wait, but this city of Houston, this state of Texas, this country of the United States was not built by those who waited and rested and wished to look behind them.
We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. We have begun to develop the ideas that will give birth to the reality of journeys to the stars. From our small beginnings of ships and airplanes and rockets, we are now on the road to greater adventures than have ever been dreamed possible. For we are most certainly destined to become space and time travelers. Next on The Learning Channel, join us to understand how high-tech breakthroughs let us travel through time as we continue with The Practical Guide to the Universe. of history, such dreams were the stuff of myth and fantasy. People had no idea of the kind of medium they would have to go through to reach the planets or stars. They didn't know how far they would have to travel, and they were not sure what they would find if somehow they did get there. Even after people learned to make machines which could fly, travel into space was prevented by the speeds necessary to leave the surface of the Earth. Escape velocity, as it is called, is about 25,000 miles an hour. But breakthroughs did come as new rockets were built. It is an ironic note in history that the technology necessary for human beings to reach. People have always been enchanted with the idea of leaving the bondage of the Earth's gravity and journeying to some place beyond. According to the Old Testament, a chariot of fire carried the prophet Elijah up into heaven. In 1694, astronomer Johannes Kepler considered a journey to the moon in his work Somnium. And Edgar Rice Burroughs wrote many fantasies that took place on Mars. The human heart longs for expanded horizons, to see new things, and to discover that in this frighteningly vast universe, we are not alone. Or might be redesigned to deliver payloads, and perhaps even men, into orbit. The Soviet Union got there first. In 1957, they launched the first artificial satellite called Sputnik into orbit around the Earth. Russia's successful launch threw down the gauntlet to the United States of America. In 1961, President John Kennedy responded with a challenge of his own to put a man on the moon before the decade was out. Now it is time to take longer strides. Time for a great new American enterprise. Time for this nation to take a clearly leading role. the dream of spaceflight was developed in the nightmare of war. At the beginning of World War II, Adolf Hitler commanded the scientific community in Germany 
to develop rockets capable of delivering devastating blows to his enemies. The result was the infamous V-2 rocket used by Hitler to rain destruction upon London. But for all its wicked past, the V-2 is considered the grandfather of today's modern launch vehicles. By the end of World War II, developing missile technology made the idea of reaching into space a realistic one. Scientists saw how the rockets of war